<clears throat> thank you, Melanie, and um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Michael Reynolds from Europe Editions, and um, I'm very happy to be here, and happy that you're here, and happy to be here with these wonderful uh, authors and, and guests. Um, I'm going to jump right in, Philippe Lanson. Uh, I'm hoping that first you can tell us a little bit about Charlie Hebdo, about the magazine, about what it means to French society, to French culture. Good evening to, to all of us. Um, I will answer the question in French, and I can, I can translate. Think, um, Charlie Hebdo uh, is a journal satirique hebdomadaire, français, très connu en France, uh, qui a été créé dans les années uh, 1960, uh, donc uh, au lendemain de, de la guerre d'Algérie. Et c'est un journal dont les bases étaient l'anticolonialisme, l'anticléricalisme, euh, l'antigolisme et en fait euh, donc la lutte contre euh, ce qui était considéré à ce moment-là comme des pouvoirs en place mais une lutte qui passait par la satire le cartoon Charlie Hebdo is a satirical French weekly newspaper it's very famous in France it was founded in the 1960s after the Algerian War of Independence, and the foundations for the newspaper was anti-colonialism, anti-clericalism, anti-Gaulism. So fights that were considered at the time to be against the power that was in place and that were satirical. Et aussi très tôt, uh, un journal qui a été uh, très favorable à l'écologie dès les années 70. Donc, c'était vraiment ce qu'on peut considérer comme un journal euh, très à gauche et contre-culturel, qui a employé euh, parmi les meilleurs dessinateurs de sa génération, de, de, de plusieurs générations, euh, en sachant que le monde des dessinateurs, je ne suis pas dessinateur, mais je connais un peu ce monde euh, pour travailler avec eux, est un monde euh, comme celui des artistes où on, on se... Il n'y a pas des héritiers, mais il y a des, des transmissions. Euh, voilà. C'est-à-dire que les, 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 les jeunes dessinateurs qui arrivaient à Charlie connaissaient parfaitement le travail de leurs aînés et ils étaient en quelque sorte euh, euh, adoubés, accueillis et adoubés euh, par, euh, par ces anciens dessinateurs. Et c'est comme ça que Charlie a continué à vivre euh, jusque finalement... Euh, vivre et survivre avec bien des, des problèmes puisque c'est un journal qui a été interdit euh, en particulier à la mort de De Gaulle pour un dessin euh, très satirique et, et ce journal a, a vécu comme ça des, des périodes de, il a toujours fait problème à la société française précisément parce que son, 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 sa nature était de transgresser euh, par les formes euh, le l'ordre du dialogue politique et social. Also, uh, Charlie Hebdo, very early on, was a newspaper that was in favor of environmentalism. As early as the 1970s, it participated in this struggle. So it was a publication that was very much on the left, counter-cultural, and it employed the best cartoonists of its generation and indeed of several generations. I myself am not a cartoonist, but I've come to know that world through my work with Charlie, and I know that it's something where people work a little bit like artists. That is to say, there's no inheritance. People aren't heirs, but there's a transmission. People pass things along so that when young cartoonists would arrive to start working at Charlie Hebdo, they would know their elders work perfectly and their elders would welcome them and usher them into the publication. And 
it's really through that that Charlie continued to survive over the years because it's a publication that faced many problems. Um, it was banned, notably at the death of de Gaulle for publishing a very satirical drawing. Um, so it's a publication that has always been considered problematic in French society by its very nature, which is to transgress the forms of political and social dialogue. Et pour finir, euh, pour aller vite sur cette évolution, ce qui s'est passé euh, à partir, disons, des années 2000, c'est que la, les, demandes de, les demandes de répression et d'interdiction contre ce journal, qui, est, qui, qui, venait, qui était donc un pur produit de la liberté des années 70 et 80, de la liberté d'expression qui s'était dévelop développée dans ces deux décennies-là, à partir des années 2000, le, la demande de, de morale et de répression n'est plus venue du sommet du pouvoir de l'État, ce qui veut dire en France l'État, mais elle, elle est venue de groupes euh, divers, euh, et en particulier évidemment de, de groupes euh, musulmans, qui ont considéré que le journal euh, les offensait. Euh, donc ce qui est très intéressant de comprendre, quoi qu'on en pense, c'est qu'il y a eu un basculement dans la demande de répression. Elle venait plus du sommet, elle venait de, de la base, de, en tout cas de certaines bases. Just in closing, to, to quickly describe the evolution of Charlie Hepto, what started to happen um, basically in the 2000s was that the demands for repression and for things to be forbidden that came against the newspaper, um, that a, a newspaper that was a product of the freedom that was found in the 1970s and the 80s, um, the, the free expression that developed in those decades, starting in the 2000s, these demands of, for repression started to come not from the state, from the government, but from a variety of groups, especially Muslim groups, that considered it was offensive in some way. So whatever you may think of it, it's interesting to note that there was this switch, this, this radical switch in repression, that it started the demand for repression. It started to come at this point not from the summit, but from the base. Et c'est comme ça qu'on en est arrivé euh d'une part à l'affaire des caricatures de Mahomet en 2006, puis à une première agression contre le journal en 2011, puis à l'attentat de 2015. And that's how we got to first the, the scandal, the case around the caricatures of the prophet in 2006, then in 2011, a first attack against the newspaper, and then the attack of 2015. So, uh, as Bob Dylan sings, uh, times are changing. <laughs> Dinao Mengistu, I, I, you've spent considerable time in, in Paris. Um, was Charlie Hebdo part of that time? Did it, did it, did it, was it a feature of your experience of France, of Paris at that time? Um, yes, yeah, it was, it was everywhere. I mean, we, I also had a wife who worked in publishing, um, so it was very present in our house, and it was very present in our converse, conversations. Um, you know, it's a very different sensibility than the one we're used to in America, and um, you sort of learn to actually understand the vital role that Charlie Hebdo played in the society, which is very different from how we, I think, imagine and understand what a satirical newspaper like that does. Um, it offends but it offends democratically, right? And it challenges more than anything um, the sort of authority of the state, of a culture, of any value system that says you don't have the right to do this. And that idea that this paper is there to constantly push back against what is considered acceptable or what is considered permissible, not because it wants to espouse any values, but because it wants to create a certain liberty for everyone, right? There's something really democratic in that idea. Um, that these rights can't be contained. If we allow them to be circumscribed for one group, then they become circumscribed mm. for all of us. Mm. Um, so it was, it was always very present, and I remember reading it sometimes and, and, and thinking, God, that's, that's, that's awful. Um, but you also knew the next day you would find something that was very comical, and you knew the next day you would find it um, not so, that you should be subject to 
its humor um, mm -hmm. and that you should be um, indicted in that humor at the same time. That seemed like a necessary exercise. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, you, you, you've alluded to this um, in, in your answer, but does Charlie Hebdo have a political position, an ideological position? Uh, about what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, does it align itself, has it ever aligned itself with a, a political party, with a political no, party? No, uh, really not. We, uh, um, I can't, no. It, it's not with a, it, as far as I know, it has never been with a party. And since I've been working uh, there, which means uh, 2003, I never saw, uh, and we, we don't agree between each other, however. Mm. We are uh, so... Uh, there are a lot of differences between people. We are individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the cartoonists uh, have their, uh, their own ideas, which I, I don't share. Mm -hmm. we, I know because I can speak with them. From, and we always uh, were arguing during the conference, as I write in the book, uh, the famous day of the conference. We were arguing and, most of all, uh, making fun of ourselves arguing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, humor was a, was a party. Mm -hmm. There's just one wonderful sentence where, from Philip's book where he writes, take the most abject or ridiculous point of view and turn it inside out by absurdity in a great burst of laughter and with the worst taste possible. That was the spirit of Charlie at a time when common sense was usually the rug under which flatterers swept their little piles of shit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How is it possible to run a magazine with that spirit? It seems like complete chaos. Well, actually, um, if I am honest, um, I give you a rest for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, you may thank me after a while. <laughs> and uh, so uh, what uh, the fact is that uh, the day of the attack on 7th of January 2015, the newspaper was almost dying. It was not the first time in, the, in its life. It is a phoenix. <laughs> and uh, now we can say it is really a phoenix, but uh, it, uh, he, the, the newspaper had closed already one, two times. Huh? Mm. Uh, and uh, before a long time ago. And uh, each time, because it is on the... Um, on the marge, uh, on, sur la marge. On the edge? On the edge. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you are on the edge, it's always not only uh, dangerous, but uh, you know that very few people will follow you. Uh, sometimes you are trendy. And it happened to Charlie. When I entered Charlie in 2003, I would say from 2003 to 2000, during four or five years, the newspaper was absolutely trendy which means a cultural uh, world and so on, would read it. And then, step by step, these people who were reading Charlie began to say, ah, it is too bad, state, bad taste. We don't like it. It's de mauvais goût, you know? It's uh, bad taste. a bad taste. And uh, who, why? Because at one moment, I think uh, some uh, ideas and cartoons of Charlie are in, uh, with the movement of the society. And in other moments, they are not anymore. But as it is not an institution like Le Monde or the New York Times, well, we have very few uh, fidel readers. Faithful readers. Faithful readers. Mm -hmm. huh? uh, I would say uh, maybe uh, 50,000. Mm -hmm. 50,000. And uh, so uh, the fact is, when the attack came, we, we knew. That's why we were very free at this time, because we knew perfectly, we were speaking about it, that the, we were on the, at the end of a, of a period, and uh, that the, the newspaper was uh, on its way dying. But it is not the newspaper that died. It was the, it was the people that were killed. And that is the difference. And the paradox, the cruel and black paradox, is that uh, the fact that uh, so many people were killed and others like me injured uh, gave a new birth to the newspaper, an unexpected 
and of course uh, that we wouldn't have uh, une, une, une renaissance dont nous, dont nous ne voulions pas. Uh, a rebirth we did not want. Et uh, that is, and uh, in that sense, uh, the destiny of Charlie this day and the months after a while, when we had millions of readers, is a black cartoon. Mm. It's pure black humor, mm. what we lived. And, uh, but the, the problem was, and I, I, I write about that in the books, is that uh, many of the best cartoonists died this day, and so they were not uh, allowed anymore to draw this cartoon mm -hmm. about what happened to us. How was um, your relationship with those colleagues? Uh, you started collaborating with Charlie Hebdo in 2003. Yes. Can, can, you, can you tell me a little bit about why? What, what brought you to Charlie Hebdo? What kind of relationship you developed with, uh, with the people who were with there? the guy who was uh, the director of the newspaper at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's not uh, anymore for a long time. And uh, he asked me because he was, uh, it is the same as I told about cartoonist. He was reading what I, I'm a journalist in Liberation and he would read what I was uh, writing in Liberation. And uh, he invited me uh, in, at home to eat pasta and so on. He was playing piano and uh, there was a lot of artists uh, all, uh, always in his house. And he, step by step, uh, he asked me if I could uh, write a column in uh, a chronic in, in, in uh, Charlie. And uh, that is the way uh, I did friendship, pure friendship. And, uh, but friendship in uh, this world, uh, Dinav knows, uh, has to do with uh, talent. Because it means that uh, you, be, you, you become friends with people who think that you are a good writer. And because you think they are good writers or good uh, chief editor or whatever. Uh, there is a mixture between the, the job and, and the life, a deep mixture. Uh, and uh, that's what happened to me. And so, of course, for me, it was uh, very new because uh, Charlie was not, uh, as I say, you know, in uh, Proust, uh, in search of lost time, of lost time, uh, Swan. Uh, uh, falls in love with uh, Odette, and at the end he says, uh, gosh, I spent the best years of my life for a wife who was not my genre. My, my type. My type. <laughs> well, Charlie was not my type, and I almost lost my life for, for, for him, for it. And it was not my type at all. I was uh, first, as a journalist, I was a real uh, uh, journalist, uh, journalist, pure journalist. And uh, Charlie is not about uh, journalism. It's, uh, it's about expression of uh, uh, sensibilities through cartoons and texts, more writers and journalists. So it was very new for me to be here. And I liked it because, and I, was, I remember at the very beginning, it was surprising for me because uh, in Liberation, like in Le Monde, or I suppose in the New York Times, the, press, the conference between uh, people uh, we are very serious. We are talking about actuality and, uh, you know, the world and Trump and uh, uh, etc. And uh, it's very serious. But in Charlie, it was not this way. In Charlie, they were not journalists. They were artists. So they were making fun of everything and telling a lot of stupidities. Uh, because they knew that when you say nine stupidities, the tenth is, can be a genius uh, one you know, and a, a very good idea. And uh, so it was uh, very new for me. And uh, in a way, uh, it, it gave me more freedom. Uh, I went on as a journalist in Liberation, and I opened another door in Charlie. More, uh, uh, more free, more free and more uh, irresponsible. Um, irresponsible. More irresponsible, <laughs> in a way, you know? And uh, so uh, 
it gives you a kind of youth, mm. of course. Mm. Was this the mood on January 7th in 2015? Was it nine stupidities and one stroke of genius? Uh, definitely, was it your responsibility? Yes. Can, you, yes. can you set that scene for us a little bit? Uh, well, this day, uh, there was a, most of all a big uh, uh, arguing about the new novel of Michel Houellebecq, the French uh, novelist, Submission, which was a, the, the story about, uh, he imagined a world, uh, France, uh, not a world, a, a country, France, where um, uh, Islamists took the power, but not uh, mur uh, bloody Islamists, uh, soft ones, uh, who played the democratic game. And uh, so it's a kind of what we call a Ukraina, uh, Ukraina, and uh, or maybe a dystopia, I don't know. And, uh, and we were speaking about that because many of the cartoonists who were here, remember you are, we are in a leftist uh, newspaper, they were upset with this novel. They hadn't read at all because it was the first day. Uh, because for them it was a political uh, uh, discourse against Islam and even against Arabs, which means racist. And so they were telling, uh, I remember Kabu, who died this day, he was telling I wouldn't uh, read that because it's, uh, this guy is a, is a fasci fascist, he's a racist, he's a fascist. And uh, we were two, uh, Bernard Maris, an economist and friend of Welbeck and I, who had read the book. And we, we, uh, we would defend the book because we thought it was a novel, not a political discourse. And the novel is a place where you can live and think every kind of thing. That's why the novels are done for. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we were arguing about that. And of course we didn't, uh, and so a lot of things uh, and uh, people shouting, but shouting and making fun of everything. And then uh, it's almost at the end of this uh, arguing and moment of the conference that the killers enter. Mm. Uh, two minutes after. And then? And then, uh, and then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, there were two minutes of uh, slaughter, and uh, which I write about. It took me time to write about that, of course. And I tried to, to write it uh, the most possible from inside and from outside at the same time. Mm. As a writer, that's what I, I thought I, I had to do. Uh, it was very short because the, uh, it was two minutes. And uh, I, 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 I say the killers, the two killers. Now we know there are two. There were two, but at, the, at this time I, I didn't know because I was uh, lying on the floor, and uh, I only see, I only saw two black legs, a pair of black legs. So, for me, there was only one killer, and the guy uh, got uh, closer and closer to me, killing people. So it was uh, as I uh, as I write, one bullet, Allahu Akbar. One bullet, Allahu Akbar. One bullet, Allahu Akbar. Just like that. So, and coming closer, as I say, like a bell, uh, getting closer to me. And, uh, and so, the more the death was getting closer, the more I was like a child, going back to my childhood. And uh, so, and doing what the children are doing, playing the dead Indian. You know? and, uh, and that worked because I, I suppose the guy thought I was dead. Mm -hmm. But I was uh, severely injured, which means I was absor absolutely in, uh, in, the, in my blood. Mm -hmm. And as I, was, uh, I wouldn't move, he certainly thought uh, I was dead, but um, from a point of view of a, of a writer, I have 
to think about what he could have in his head at this moment. And I think he had very few things in his head because the terrible tension of such a moment, two minutes, no more, is not only for the victims, but it is too for the Le Bourreau. For the executioner. For the executioner. He is under pressure too. So I think he was in a hurry. They were in a hurry, the two brothers. And that, the, that's what they, they, they left thinking that they had done the job. But uh, happily, they, they, they didn't do all the job, which means they didn't do it because the newspaper is still alive. Because when they leave the place, they said, it's very interesting uh, on a psychiatric point of view. They didn't say, we've killed the people of Charlie. They say, we have killed Charlie, which means they, they, uh, they're, they're made this confusion between the symbol, which is the newspaper, and the people they killed. And, uh, and so after, so uh, these were almost uh, less than two minutes. And then I opened my eyes, see uh, certain things I write about. Mm. about dead, my dead friends. And uh, this is a moment I tried to write as, as deep as possible again about what is the time at this moment. Because many people ask me uh, how long uh, before the, the uh, Les Secours. Before the emergency services? Before the emergency service coming. And uh, it's not possible for me to answer this question because I know they came fast, but how fast? This is a question for people who, who were not here. Inside this room, the weather was uh, two minutes and then maybe a quarter, but it was one century. It was an entire life and more than that even. So, uh, and I tried to, uh, write about that, this feeling of time when uh, you are absolutely uh, floating in this time without limits. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I was, was going to turn to you on that. <laughs> no, there's, there's, also, there's um, you know, the title of the book is called Surviving, or the subtitle in English is called Surviving Charlie Hebdo. But I, I kept thinking there's almost a way in which obviously, of course, you do survive, but something doesn't survive. The, there's a death that still sort of happens. Um, and just, you might if I just read, just, there's just a couple of sentences where as the shooting is happening, you, you can almost sort of see that what part of you sort of does die, where you kind of split consciously. Um, you write, the voice of the man I still was said to me, hmm, we've been hit in the hand, but we don't feel anything. We were two, he and I, he who was beneath me, more exactly, and I levitating above, and he addressed me from below, using the first person plural. My eyes passed over the hand and saw beyond it, a meter away, the body of a man lying on his stomach, whose checked jacket I recognized and who was not moving. My eye turned to the head and saw through his hair the brain tissue of this man, this colleague, this friend, which was sticking out somewhat from his skull. Bernard is dead, the man I was said to me, and I replied, yes, he's dead, and we merged on him. You've spoken, um, I mean, just a few minutes before we, we um, came out about sort of the way that Philippe approaches this split consciousness and, and, and this sort of extension of time. Um, I'm not a writer, but I imagine that's a difficult thing to do. And I, I just sort of wondered how you um, read that and, and almost from a technical standpoint, whether um, you saw something particular in there, something special, something. Yeah, um, you know, I, I was I was reading it and thinking about you know we we have a I think a pretty good understanding of that trauma does something um, where it sort of destroys and perhaps even sort of splits us into more than one, um, but the act of writing and so even over the course of this text you see these multiple worlds that you're inhabiting and you narrate this book not by driving us directly towards the incident towards the attack. But we never forget the attack is there, and yet you're sort of circling 
through it and inhabiting all of these different worlds. Um, and what I guess part of what I was sort of curious about is was the way this book manages to still try and stitch together some unified whole, some self that either resides beyond the attack or something new that's sort of forged out of it. Um, and, I, and the way literature, in fact, is mm. kind of an essential element. This novel or this book is, um, is as much a story of the attack as it is a story of, of the ways in which you've sort of pieced yourself together and pieced these events back together. Uh, yes, I think are, uh, je, what I can say is, uh, I will turn it in French and um, have a rest. <laughs> Et uh, quand j'ai écrit uh, ce, ré ce, ce récit, je ne savais pas exactement ce que les raisons pour lesquelles je l'écrivais. When I wrote this narrative, I didn't know exactly the reasons for which I was writing it. Et à vrai dire, je m'en foutais. And to tell the truth, I really didn't care. Uh, après l'avoir écrit, euh, il m'a semblé que c'était un récit qui euh, cherchait euh, à rétablir euh, la fluidité, la, la continuité euh, dans des vies, pas seulement la mienne, qui avait été brutalement ou interrompu ou euh, transformé par l'attentat. After I wrote the book, it seemed to me that this was a narrative that was seeking to reestablish fluidity, continuity in lives, not just mine, that had been either brutally inter interrupted or transformed by this attack. Et je pense maintenant que c'est finalement à la fois comme écrivain et comme lecteur euh, ce que je recherche euh, dans la littérature. Euh, une continuité. Un, un récit, qui, des récits, quelle que soit leur forme, qui établissent euh, des continuités dans les vies qu'ils racontent et peu m'importe qu'il soit de fiction ou de non-fiction. And now I think that ultimately both as a writer and a reader that's what I look for in literature. Continuity, a narrative or narratives and no matter what form they're in that establish continuities in the lives that they tell about. And it doesn't matter to me whether that's fiction or non-fiction. C'est-à-dire que ce que me donne la littérature, euh, à la fois comme auteur et comme lecteur, euh, c'est la capacité à restituer euh, le, le flux de la vie euh, qui est si souvent... Euh, brutalisé et interrompu. Et cette euh, continuité n'est pas du tout, euh, pour moi, artificielle. Je pense que c'est justement une force supérieure euh, que l'écriture permet d'obtenir. Et en tout cas, moi, c'est vers ça que je, je veux aller, comme auteur et comme lecteur. That is to say that what literature gives me, both as a reader and a writer, is this ability to recreate the flow of life that is so often brutalized and interrupted. And this is, hmm, I can't read my handwriting. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a superior force um, that writing can achieve and that is what I want to go towards both as a reader and a writer. It's a continuity that's absolutely not artificial.
And that's the superior force that writing can achieve and what I want to go toward as a writer and a reader. This is, um, this book, Disturbance, is also very much a book about books and a book about authors uh, and a book that does pose the question, um, what do those books and what do those authors offer me after an experience like the one that you, um, you experienced? Well, um, there are few books, but they are very important. Mm. Uh, but uh, some, away, some, some of them by chance and some others not. The three main books, uh, as people who read the, the book knows, were um, Kafka's letter uh, to Milena, uh, Proust uh, in search of lost, of lost time, and uh, Thomas Mann, uh, Magic Mountain. And, uh, and the three has, uh, had different stories with me because uh, there is the first difference is that I've, I have read already for a long time and I was still reading and reading again from time to time uh, Proust uh, novel. Uh, I, would, uh, I used to say that I, uh, I know this uh, novel. It's more than a novel, it's a word, but I know it like my pockets. And it's like, for me, like a house. You know, one of these Turkish houses with a lot of entries, and I can enter from uh, by every gate. Uh, so I, 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 I didn't need, I don't need to li read a uh, Proust, uh, Proust novel uh, from the very beginning to the end, or I can enter everywhere. I know the place. So that's what I want. I asked my father and a very good friend to go to my home and bring back me in search of lost time. That was my choice. And Magic Mountain was my choice too. But I never, uh, I've never read it, so it was different. And I thought, after a few days, well, now you are here in this damn hospital for a long time, so you, at least you have time to read Magic Mountain and to share the experience of people who are in Davos in the sanatorium. And uh, and I had a little story too about that. Is that. Uh, the, the little um, uh, book, uh, the, the example, exemplaire? The copy I had. The copy I had uh, had been given to me by a very old friend. And uh, uh, maybe more than 10 years before. And as, you, as uh, many people, we have a big li uh, library in, uh, at home. It's full of books I never read. And, uh, and this was one of them. So I asked again my father, and said, bring me back the magic mountain. And uh, I don't know how they found it, but they found it and brought me back to the hospital. And uh, the, the, the woman who gave me the friend, uh, who gave me the book uh, more than 10 years before, uh, she had told me she was a great reader. She is a great reader. Two books gave me fever after reading them. 40, uh, 40 degrees fever. The, 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 yeah, I, I can't do that. <laughs> yes, very high fever. <laughs> and uh, so I was astonished. And she told me the first one was uh, 100 Years of Solitude of Garcia Marquez. And the second one was Magic Mountain. So I thought if this book gave her uh, so, many fe so, so much fever, Maybe uh, it will help me to recover with less fever. <laughs> and uh, so I, I was very happy to, to have this book. And the third one was given by my, uh, my friend and chief in Liberation, in the literary service. And uh, once uh, she arrived uh, to the hospital, I think it was uh, maybe one week after the attack. And when she arrived, as it happened very often, I was not in my room. I was in the block downstairs in the operating room operating mm -hmm. in the own, uh, operating room which means uh, in the uh, what i call the monde en bas which i don't know i was the, in. maybe the underworld the or underworld. the underworld <coughs> and uh, so and uh, she had no 
she would like she she wanted to let me uh, a note, uh, uh, but she had no paper. But she had a gift for me, which was the letters to Milena, and she wrote on the book a little note, and let me the book, and uh, and this book. So uh, that was a chance, and I began to read it, and uh, it was very important for me because uh, first I could. Uh, these were letters, so I had a lot of problems to concentrate. So uh, you, you would say uh, concentrate with Kafka is not very easy. Yeah. And uh, I would say yes with the novel, Kafka's novel, but with the letters, it was easier for me because they are short. And then uh, in the letters of Milena, many of the letters, of course, have, have to do with the uh, uh, disease of Kafka, uh, tuberculosis. And uh, Kafka is absolutely uh, uh, frightening in the way he is uh, facing uh, his disease and uh, the fact that uh, we always deserve what happens to us in a way or another. And uh, he has, I don't know if you know the photo of him with his hat and a light smile which is called close. It's a beautiful smile because it is a absolute humanity, but at the same time, it's evil. And uh, I knew this photo and reading this, the letters of Milena where he's speaking about hell, about uh, the fact that we, at the end we can't complain and the fact that we have to be a... Uh, uh, as Kafka was uh, until uh, being crazy, uh, scrupulous, scrupulous, uh, um, scrupulous. We have the, um, um, make the highest demands of himself. Yes, mm. well, it is uh, the idea, mm. and uh, so it helped me a lot. Uh, as I say, he was a, he has been at that at that moment at, at that moment a tough master. Mm? Very tough, tough friend, uh, and uh, with my, I suppose, with my, uh, my personality, uh, in the state which was mine at this moment, this was the best, to have tough friends. And Kafka was the first of them. You, you said something right now about the, when you noticed, when you named the, the operating word as one of the underworlds. And one of the things I was trying to almost map out over the course of this book is all the different worlds that you sort of locate over the course of this narrative. There's the world before the attack. There's the world almost during the attack. And then the multiple layers of worlds after the attack. And then there's also the world of the imagination, the different scenarios that you think might have been possible had you walked in the door two minutes later, or had you stayed in the bathroom. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if the writing of this was, you know, you talked about the continuity. Does it become a way to stitch those worlds together? Do they, or do they remain separate and distinct? Do they always sort of remain kind of orbiting around each other, or do they actually begin to kind of cohere into something more whole? Yes, that six, uh, I, I don't know, you are a writer too, it would be interesting for me. But for me, yes, uh, it is what he's writing about. Uh, about to, uh, we all have uh, different words. We, we, we live in different worlds and we, we, we think and we imagine different words. And all these words, uh, a way to give them the continuity I talk, uh, and the form uh, is to write, if, if you are a writer. Most of people, they, they have these different words and uh, they even don't know. The, they, they, they go from a word to another and there is no, uh, there is no bridge, you know, or very, and they don't think about it because I think this is the usual life. But what happened in my case is that uh, suddenly these words uh, add a, uh, terrible borders between them. And so I, I was forced to face it and to find the way to make a tale about it. 
and then uh, first to, to face it and to live in these different worlds. And then when I felt better and uh, with uh, an, uh, enough energy uh, to, to write, which, which, uh, to write about it, which came later after. And uh, so yes, for me, it's, it is, uh, but if we think about that, and I will uh, switch to French. Uh, il m'arrive souvent de penser uh, à ce que serait ma vie uh, si je n'avais pas été uh, ce matin-là à Charlie Hebdo. Uh, il s'en est fallu de très peu. I often think about what my life would have been if I hadn't been at Charlie Hebdo that morning. And that very nearly happened. Et je vis très concrètement avec cette idée euh, qui, est, qui, à certains moments, est, est devenue presque un, un projet littéraire. Euh, imaginez la vie que j'aurais eue si je n'étais pas allé ce jour-là à Charlie Hebdo. Euh, C'est quelque chose auquel je pense, à la, une chose à laquelle je pense beaucoup, mais... I live in a very concrete matter with that idea. At some moments, it nearly becomes a literary project, imagining what my life would have been if I hadn't gone to Charlie Hebdo that day. It's something I think about a great deal, but... D'une part, ça serait un roman. C'est-à-dire que là, je deviendrais vraiment un autre personnage, puisque ce n'est justement pas ma vie. Et, et je pense, et deuxièmement, je pense que écrire cette histoire, donc ce roman, me rendrait fou. Donc je ne l'écrirai pas. Mais j'y pense. On the one hand, um, if I wrote that novel, I would become another character since it's not my life. On the other, if I were to write that story, that novel, I would go mad. But I do think about it. Um, Disturbance is not an angry book. Yeah, it's. Um, an embracing book, a very humane book, complex book uh, that also describes some harrowing moments, um, but a book full of beautiful moments also. Uh, and one of them that I wanted to mention before we open up for questions um, comes quite late in the book when, uh, and I, I think this in itself is, is beautiful, not long after leaving the hospital, you redo your bookshelves. Yeah. Um, among, you know, among the, the very first things that you do. Uh, and looking at those bookshelves, you think what I, or you write what I had experienced um, could nourish, could better, could improve upon the lives that those books offer me. Um, it's a beautiful thought and I think a beautiful testimony to um, the power of literature and a fitting sort of end perhaps to our conversation here at the Center for Fiction and I, I think we have uh, some time for questions, correct? Is there any papers? Yes, if you would wait for that. Um, well, thank you very much. <laughs> this book is uh, really extraordinary. Uh, it's an amazing description, actually, of uh, uh, of pain. I mean, of, you don't speak much about pain, but there's an acceptance. It's a datum. It's the acceptance of pain. It's there because it's uh, you have to go through to survive. So I would just have a question. Um, you were, were just saying that uh, we have different worlds that we uh, bridge uh, if we are writers uh, and that you are interested as a writer in, in the continuity. Uh, just, just a little question, I'm curious, what would you say 
uh, for you uh, as you are writing this book were these different worlds? Well, can you repeat the question? Uh, what were the different worlds uh, in you as you were? Uh, oh. Can you name them, the different worlds? When, um, as Dino say, uh, said, first of all, there is, uh, of course, the world of uh, the which is the life I had before the attack, uh, which I perfectly remember, of course, but with uh, some cuts, uh, which means that uh, it, I know it has been my life, and uh, I know it is not my life anymore. And uh, it has been part of the book to try to find the form to tell it. Uh, then, when I was, uh, if we are in the nine months of the book, which are the months of the hospital, um, there, were, there, there is the world of uh, the hospital and the world of people who are coming from outside. And still, if here some people have been uh, patients for a long time, I belong still to this first world of hospital. Because first I, I, I go on, uh, I still go. But then because uh, what I have with uh, my, the relationship I have with my care caretakers mm -hmm. is a kind of a second private life. It's a, if I would have two families. And this, uh, this life has almost nothing to do with uh, the other one. But in the sense that uh, I tell very few things of this life to the other one. But to my care, care uh, caretakers, I can speak a lot about my real, so real life. I don't, it's not my real life. The two are the real lives. So that, uh, you know, you have before and after, and then you have, uh, this, uh, I would say, inside the hospital, outside the hospital. And then you have uh, what I can do, of course, uh, as a writer, and what I live, which is different. To give you precisely an example, you t uh, as uh, Michael said, there is no anger in this book. But there was no anger when I was writing it. I was in Roma, in a very beautiful place. Uh, with my wife, and uh, in Paris, my father was dying. I wrote about it too, and uh, which means I was thinking more about him than about me. I had problems still, but uh, in this moment, I was thinking about him. And I would go back from time to time, of course, from Roma to Paris to see him, step by step, uh, dying in the hospital. And this was another world that I could share with my father dying because uh, I knew perfectly the hospital. It was not the same hospital as mine, but when I entered the hospital, it was home. I, had, uh, I was looking at uh, Le Poste de Soins. And the, the care station? The care station with a, uh, almost a professional high, but from inside, not from outside. It's very difficult to explain. And, uh, and so I, I could, and, uh, and then the life of the writer, when I was writing the book, was uh, absolutely uh, linked with the fact that I was uh, in Roma at this time. And uh, which means I was uh, inside the beautiful city and uh, in a world of beauty. And I had to write about a world which was not a world of beauty. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, the fact that I was in all this beauty and all, all this peace uh, helped me to find uh, what is the one of the most important thing in uh, writing, le ton. The tone. The tone. It is about, writing is about, 
is always a music. It's a cliche, but it's true. And uh, until you don't find the tone of the narrate of the narrator, but uh, and of the characters, however, uh, better to walk in the street and and to do other things than write and uh, than writing. And uh, so uh, the circumstances helped. And this is the life of the writer, which is not the life of the man. So you can see there are almost three or four different uh, 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 division of words. Yeah, thank you. I, I haven't read the book yet. I look forward to reading it. I, and I'm not sure if you touched on this, but I wonder how after after this uh, horror, uh, there were you know always different reactions. And I remember controversy with Penn and people that were stupidly um, they didn't want to attend uh, an event because Hebdo was being honored, like with the Rushdie affair and Lacar. You know how that how that impacted you and the others because it seemed like it'd be well, painful, uh, angering. I I don't know. I won't I won't use my adjectives. But. Uh, I was not angry. désolé pour eux. I was sorry for them. Parce que il est toujours pour moi étrange et presque comique de voir des écrivains s'opposer à la liberté d'expression. Because it's always for me strange and and nearly comical to see writers go against the freedom of expression. I have nothing more to tell about that and about them. I'm sure we have more but we'll take one last question. Uh, first of all, I'm, I feel really honored to be in your presence and journalists like you who go out and do what you do. Um, and now for the question, um, we all have traumas, maybe not at the, obviously not as the level as you do, but we all do. Was there a point where you said, okay, you know, shit happened, like this is bad, now I have to move on and do all the human things that I have to go on and do? Was there a point where you sort of like said, told yourself, get over yourself, like you, you, you gotta live. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted the question to be precise, I'm sorry to. Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, C'est pas comme ça que, en tout cas pour moi, les choses se sont passées. Uh, je, je, je me suis retrouvé dans une situation extrême uh, qui m'a totalement libéré de toute responsabilité, sauf une, euh, lutter pour me reconstruire. Je parle de ces mois-là. Et donc, d'un seul... Oui, alors, voilà, vas-y. No, for me, it's not like that that things happened. I found myself in an extreme situation that totally freed me from every responsibility except one, which was to fight to rebuild myself. And I'm talking about those specific months. Donc, la situation qui était la plus inconfortable qui soit, est devenue aussi pour moi la plus confortable. au sens où je crois qu'elle m'a donné une extraordinaire liberté dans mon lit, de, dans, mon, 
dans ma chambre pour accueillir, écouter et comprendre tous ceux qui y entraient. Je n'avais que ça à faire. J'étais une sorte de super journaliste euh, immobile, super empathique, euh, qui, qui pompait euh, la vie euh, de, de, de tous les amis et de tous les soignants qui passaient. I was in the most uncomfortable situation possible, and it became for me the most comfortable, by which I mean that I think it gave me an extraordinary freedom in my bed, in my room, to welcome and understand all those who entered it. I became a kind of super journalist, immobile, empathetic, taking whatever possible from all those who entered it, friends, caretakers, etc. Donc, pour conclure, euh, écouter systématiquement les autres alors que j'étais au centre de l'action, A été, la meilleure, la, a été la meilleure manière de m'oublier et plus tard d'écrire. In closing, systematically listening to others while I was at the heart of the action was the best way for me to forget myself and later to write.